My name is Jeff Robinson, and I serve as the lead pastor of Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. And I want to thank you for checking out this message. In this series, we'll address God, sexuality, and human value. We're fully aware that we live in a diversity of viewpoints and perspectives on these issues, and I want to be clear from the heart of our church. We welcome every single person from every background and belief as we are all seeking truth and meaning. We have a deep conviction that every person has intrinsic value having been made in the image of God. So let me be clear, again, we love you and we value you as a person regardless of your background or your beliefs. And when we allow scripture to speak, we will all at some point feel a bit uncomfortable when confronted with truths that challenge us to consider issues from God's perspective as revealed in his word. But our intent is never to hurt or embarrass, but to simply be honest about what the Bible actually teaches. So if anything we discuss in this series causes you some discomfort, Please hear us out and know that you're not the only one because God's word challenges all of us. God loves all of us so much and his love is revealed by calling us to walk his path, which may be brand new compared to everything we've ever felt or been told. So no matter your persuasion or your past, know this. There has never been a person alive except for Jesus Christ who has not needed God's grace to transform some aspect of their lives. We all live in a broken world. We are all in need of redemption. We all can come to Jesus Christ, who is an equal opportunity Savior. Good morning, Grace. Man, guess what happened? You guys came back. After the last two weeks, man, we've done some heavy, heavy lifting on some incredibly, I mean, for complex and sensitive and controversial stuff. Just, But it's what God says about it in his word. But you guys chose to come back. I love you guys. Thanks for being willing to let me be your pastor. I love Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. And if you are are visiting with us, if you're new or tuning in uh, online, we welcome you into this place. And at Grace, we have people who have been following Jesus for decades, and there are many of us who are kind of just checking this whole thing out. So what we, what we believe here is that the foundation and the authority is in Scripture. It's in the Word of God. And, man, we want to we wanna build our lives, our church on that. So this morning what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Word of God and see what God has to say about God and human value, but I just want you to know, right out of the gate, this is not an exercise in the pastor thinks he knows it all, or the pastor thinks he's smart, or smarter than anybody else. This is an, an entirely focused time to say, man, we just want to communicate what God has always revealed to us in his word, and what Christians throughout the ages have believed about this incredible topic of human value. Before we do that, there's something that's going to go down this afternoon at Ocean Reef Park at 5 p.m. If you are a late person, it's going to be at 4 p.m. Uh, late people, it's going to be at 4 p.m. If you're really late, we're going to be there. Actually, you need to leave right now. And so we're going to have an awesome time, 5 p.m. We're going to kick it off with beach. Hey, some of you are like, thank you, Pastor Jeff. Just tell him to do that the rest of the week, all right? I'm married to him. That's my roommate, right? And so we're going to gather at Ocean Reef Park at 5 p.m. sharp. Again, if you're a late person, that means at 4 p.m. sharp, we're going to start baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who have said, I am ready to be a known follower of Christ. I, it's going to be awesome. And so if you're getting baptized, uh, you want to be there at 430. And, uh, and then we're going to gather together and just celebrate in a public setting new life that Jesus Christ has given to us. And we celebrate that new life through baptism. All right. And also next Sunday after the third service, we're going to have starting point. We were not able to have starting point on the first Sunday of September because of the scare with Hurricane Dorian. And uh, if you're new with us, starting point is kind of what it it means what it, what it says. It is the starting point. It's an hour-long class. It's how you uh, get plugged in here at Grace or have more questions answered. And we're going to have free lunch, free child care. So, guys, if you have a date, it's a great thing to uh, take her to. Free lunch, let's say that. And um, <clears throat> uh, we believe strongly 
that the Bible teaches us, the, the Word of God leads us to not just uh, shop and hop forever, but to be plugged into a local church to where we can be who Christ has created us to be, use all those gifts and talents to get plugged in and help God's church move forward wherever that may be. So if you've not been to Starting Point yet, we would invite you to come next week. All right. Now, I want to say, as we begin our message this morning, that this is the last Sunday to where you have to save up your amens. Uh, If you've been with us for the last several weeks, we've talked about some complex, sensitive topics from the Word of God. And uh, we've been kind of holding on to saying amen out loud in the service because we don't want someone who's near us to feel like we are ganging up on them if they're struggling with what we're talking about or that we're against them in any way. But I want to remind you, next Sunday, we're going to gather together, and I cannot wait for next Sunday. We're going to talk about regret that we all have and then the redemption that Jesus Christ offers us. So whether you've been here for these last three weeks or whether you're going to be, you know, you know someone who's not been to church in a long time or someone who has never been to church, next Sunday we're just going to focus on the grace and the power, the transformative beauty and truth that Jesus Christ offers us through his grace next Sunday. It's going to be awesome. So if you are an eight, like you like to say amen in church, you just save those jokers up and let them fly next week. It's going to be a come to Jesus time. I cannot wait for next week. All right? So let's reach out this week and bring somebody with us. Now, um, this morning, as we said, our message is going to be on the topic of human value. And let me say this that we've said every week. That if anything that we discuss this morning uh, challenges you, uh, maybe the word of God will, in a sense, uh, cut us deep in our heart. Know that every single one of us, when we hear the Bible taught or when we read God's word, we're all going to be challenged in some way. So know that you're not the only one. All right? And let me just say the obvious. Uh, What we're going to do this morning is what we often don't do in churches because this is quite possibly the heaviest message I think I could preach. Just trying to be honest. Uh, The reason why we don't talk about this often in church is because we like to stay away from heavy things. Um, But this is a decision that you'll have to make that I could never make for you and you can't make for the person next to you. Um, Would you prefer a pastor who's going to Teach the word of God, even when sometimes it's difficult to hear, very heavy to handle, or would you rather go through an exercise at a church when you're not being dealt honestly with? And we don't say that to say that we're a cut above another church. We're not put, there's a lot of godly, godly leaders in South Florida who are teaching the whole counsel of God's word, but I just want to put that in our minds and our hearts to remind us that when we Uh, open a topic like human value that this will be and this is okay we we run from this stuff in our culture not just in church it's okay for us sometimes to have a tense feeling because a subject is so weighty and if we're willing to hear it out and to press through and allow the lord to speak to us through his word there's going to be tremendous value for all of us on the other side make sense all right So let's drop into it. So when we talk about human value, we we realize that there could literally be dozens upon dozens of messages for weeks and weeks on end. But since we don't have that luxury, what we're going to do this morning is focus on the clearest and most obvious teachings of Scripture on human value. And what we're going to see this morning is that throughout the entire Bible, Uh, From the earliest days of Christianity to the Jewish communities that worship the one true God before Jesus came on the earth, we're going to see what God's view is on human value. And then we're going to see how incredible Jesus was that when he came on this earth, he showed us what that stuff actually looks like. It was Jesus' example in his life that showed us the value and the preciousness of every single human life that regardless of the age or the shade of skin or the stage of life Jesus and Jesus alone gives us the best reasons to believe what we deep down deep down we all know is true 
we all know that we all have value. We all deeply, intuitively know that racial hatred is morally wrong. We all deeply know that oppressing someone uh, who doesn't look like us is morally evil. We all, if we're honest with ourselves, regardless of what even some people may say, we understand deeply that there is something such as good and evil. And that's because, this morning we're going to see, that's because we've been made all in the image of God. And so primarily, I just want to say the reason for this message this morning is not for us. It's for the most defenseless ones among us. And so here's our goal this morning. Let me just give it to you right up front. Our goal this morning is rather ambitious. It is to make a case that Christianity provides the best explanation, the best explanation as to why we all have value. That's what we want to do this morning as we look at Scripture. So let's take a look at human value and consider uh, that, number one, if we believe that every person has value, then what is the source of that value? If we have these deep beliefs about human rights, then where do those rights come from? There's one option called atheism or naturalism. That's the belief that all that exists is matter. It's just stuff. There's, <clears throat> there's no God. There's no soul. There's no spirit. Philosopher of science Michael Ruse reports that the modern evolutionist, their position is that humans have an awareness of morality. And by the way, you're going to need your floaties this morning because we're going to be in the deep end most of the time. All humans have a, an awareness of morality because such an awareness is of biological worth. Morality, he says, is a biological adaptation no less than our hands and feet and teeth. That when someone says, love your neighbor as yourself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. And then he concludes with this statement that is fascinating. He says, morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. His point is that our belief in morality or justice and human rights and human values, that's only, it's only an issue of just keeping the human species alive. But if morality is illusory, if it's just a figment of our imagination, then human rights and human value are also illusory. Some may respond, well, Pastor Jeff, I mean, if we live moral lives, then that's necessary, obviously, for a functioning society. Like, it makes the neighborhood better, it makes the city better if we just all behave and we all play nice. To which we would say, of course, like, it's, be it's, it's better to live when your neighbors are acting in a moral way. They make better neighbors, but that's not the same thing as explaining why all humans have intrinsic value. Because if it's just an issue, morality that is, of keeping the species alive, then at the end of the day, we are not valuable because of what we are, but only based upon what we can do. That's why the Princeton ethicist Peter Singer claims, and I quote, Surely there will be some non-human animals whose lives, by any standard, are more valuable than the lives of some humans. And, quote, human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they exist over time. They are not persons, therefore, the life of a newborn is, a, a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. Singer is consistent in the fact that he says, if there's ultimately no God, then it ultimately boils down to an issue of what those of us who consider ourselves to be enlightened think about certain persons at certain stages and whether or not they have value or rights. You see, when we remove God from the picture, it gets scary because everything is ultimately up for grabs. We don't have to know uh, history very well to see whenever God is removed from a society 
that it ultimately comes down to those who have power or calling the shots as to who is actually human or should have human rights. There's another attempt at an explanation on why we all have value, and it's called, it's not really an attempt, I should say, but it's just a particular belief, polytheism, or the belief in many gods, so you may know it as paganism, and it basically looks like this in real life. I serve the gods, and they fuel my good fortune and my self-advancement. Basically, my own good fortune, my own self-advancement is the only goal in my life. And when that's the only goal, in other words, I do these things for the gods, little g gods, then they will give me what I need to get to where I need to go. The gods are for my self-advancement. And if that's the case, then there's no safeguard for us, or we should say no restraint, and us throwing each other underneath the bus to get where we really want to go. And when we read the Bible, and even historical examples outside of Scripture, one uh, major example of this mentality was in Canaan. It's modern-day Near East, in the area of Molech worship. Molech was a false god to where um, it was demanded that children would be sacrificed. Children in that time, in that system of thought, were not considered as valuable. They were not considered to be persons, to be nurtured and protected. But in that mindset of I sacrifice to the God, the God helps me get where I need to go and I want to go, the children were simply viewed as things there to advance adults. The understanding was that if I sacrificed my child to Molech, then I would receive favorable weather patterns for my agriculture, and I would grow in my profit. So at the heart of child sacrifice throughout the ages was the great exchange of one's offspring for the prospects of a better tomorrow. This was taking not from maybe a treasury, but taking from the cradle and saying, I'll give this so that I can get my real God, which is money. In 310 BC, the Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, not a follower of the one true God or a Christian, this is pre-Jesus, records this in regards to polytheism and uh, idol worship, specifically the worship of Kronos or Molech. There was in their city a bronze image extending its hands, palms up and sloping toward the ground, so that each of the children, when placed thereon, rolled down and fell into a sort of gaping pit filled with fire. The Greek historian Plutarch writes, quote, The whole area before the statue was filled with a loud noise of flutes and drums, so that the cries of wailing should not reach the ears of the people. And this is when you read the Old Testament, you find that God comes to the point of saying, enough is enough. And God raises up godly prophets to speak out against this sort of cruelty. We find in Psalm 106, verse 37 and 38, something very interesting. It says, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Again, this is a very heavy topic to communicate. Believe me, it's a very difficult thing to hear. But the understanding in the Old Testament and the New Testament that it was not the worship of the one true God that would lead parents to sacrifice their children. It was actually uh, demons that were leading people to commit acts of violence towards the innocent ones. Even the Apostle Paul in the New Testament instructs the believers in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, and he says, what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. But when we read the Old Testament, we find that God had delivered his people out of Egypt. And why would God's people be tempted to run away from the one God who had freed them. One scholar named J.A. Thompson says that it very well could have been that the Canaanites had fine homes, splendid art, fine literature, good trade connections around the east, and an apparent superiority in every way of life over the people of Israel. The unthinking Israelite could have been inclined to associate this wealth with some imagined favor of the gods of Canaan. In other words, what 
historians, secular and Christian, have noted is that the attraction toward polytheism and idol worship was the love of money. The seduction of wealth, guys, is nothing new. The ones who opposed these these cruel practices were uh, the Hebrews, the ones that God had chosen, said, you are my chosen people, and he gave them the scriptures, the Old Testament. They understood that it was far from the heart of God that the little ones should be sacrificed for the advancement of adults, and the Hebrew prophets and the early church, as we'll see, it's fascinating how the earliest Christians in the first century were completely unified in what scripture has always taught, and that is the little ones and the innocent ones, the ones that society pays no attention to, those are the ones that are worthy of our dignity and our respect and our lives. And we see the, the example of Jesus Christ in such co- contrast to this whole idea of sacrificing one's child to advance oneself because Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins. There are others, other attempts that are better to try to explain why we all have value and why we all have human rights. One would be theism. Uh, This is where you get all of the best examples for the existence of God, but there's not really an understanding of the identity of that God. It would be morality without an example. You get the explanation that there is an ultimate God that has every good thing. God is a maximally great being. He has all of the virtues, none of the vice. But then the question comes down to, even if we believe in some ultimate God, what does it actually look like in real life to follow that God? What does the God that exists want from me? And then we come to the beautiful story of Christian theism, what we understand to be Christianity. For human rights, this is on, in your notes and on the screen, for human rights, Christian theism offers a foundational belief, and my goodness, don't we need this today in 2019, a foundational belief that all persons, do you see that? All persons of every age, stage, and shade have been made in the image of God and thus are all worthy of dignity and respect. Every single person. That is a uniquely Judeo-Christian belief that has been made known, made realized, made accessible through the life of Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. Let me stop here for just a moment and acknowledge again, this is heavy stuff, is it not? And again, if you're here and you're not yet a follower of Christ, we welcome you into this place. We are so glad that you are here. And if you uh, believe in basic human rights, if you want to stand against much of the evil that we see and may maybe even experience in this world today, I would encourage you to know that that's why we need Jesus. Jesus is our best defense against trampling on human rights. And we'll see more the longer we go. The Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. The Bible says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his image. In other words, in the earliest chapters of the Bible, what's going on there is God is saying that human life is valuable. Which human life? All of it. Let's go to Psalm 139. This is beautiful. Verses 13 through 16. The Bible says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If you struggle with not liking yourself, with uh, what some may consider to be a low self-esteem, look, look, look here. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. This is just a way to describe the the unborn child and the mother. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Scripture tells us that we are all, all fearfully and wonderfully made because God doesn't make any junk. 
In the New Testament, we find Jesus in Mark chapter 10 when the disciples were trying to push the children away from being brought to Jesus. Their understanding was, well, Jesus is the Son of God. He's kind of, he's kind of a big deal. So he doesn't have time for children. In that day and time, outside the Jewish community, most of the pagans did not believe that children were actually, this is very hard for us to even grasp today, but here's, here's what outside of the Jewish community was the standard belief about children, not just those in the womb, but just children in general. They were not fully persons. There's a great book by a Norwegian scholar, um, and the, the book's focus is that it was because of Jesus that we began to consider children to be people. And instead of pushing away the children, Jesus says, let the little children come unto me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. You talk about a smackdown. And he says, unless you become like one of these little children, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. What is Jesus saying? He's pointing to the trust and the innocence of a child being willing to trust the authority in his or her life. And he took them in his arms, verse 16 says, and blessed them, laying his hands on them. The fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords said, oh, I know you guys have an agenda, but I'm going to stop for a few moments. Say, come here. Put some kids on my lap. Look, look into their eyes. See, the, see their little hands because they are people too. We find tremendous support in the word of God in scripture when we read it for not only the belief that all of us have value in the eyes of God and should have value in the eyes of one another, but we find this incredible theme that's woven throughout the Bible. It's the theme of unity within the people of God. We find these beautiful pictures like in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 to where people from all every nation and from all tribes and peoples and languages all stand together before Jesus Christ as equals and as part of the same family. You see in Christian theism through Christ and through Christ alone, we find the answer that we're looking for in the world today, which is how can we be unified? We find that Jesus Christ has broken down the wall of separation between Jew and Greek and between male and female, and Jesus has made all of, what, of us in Christ one. Jesus has brought together, it's like a, a beautiful tapestry that's been woven together from all of these different backgrounds and persons and nations into a brand new family. And in the family of Christ, the, the true church, we are no longer defined by old ethnic or racial hatreds, hatreds or prejudices, but we are defined by our unity in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can say that you are my brother, from another mother. So how did Christianity, how did these beliefs actually look in the earliest days of the church? You ever wondered how cool it would be to go back and just look and see some of these early Christians gathering together? Well, if you want to do some research later on, there's a first century manual that they used for catechisms. It was teaching people the basic concepts of the Christian faith. And it's called the Didache, D-I-D-A. C-H-E. And for the ones who you see writing that down, those are my nerds. First century. In the Didache, there were a number of things that it specified that if you're going to become a follower of Christ, this no longer is what you do. As we talked the last couple of weeks, it's a horrifying to, to think about, but just for historical perspective, in the Didache, it said to Romans... You will not corrupt boys. For the rich and the powerful, it was standard as we looked at uh, to, as they, as they said, to collect, quote, herds of boys. The gospel of Jesus Christ came onto the scene and said that is one reason why the righteous judgment of God exists. You will not corrupt boys. You will not have illicit sex. In other words, for the men, you have sex with your wife and your wife only. There's also 
a statement that says you will no longer expose your children. What, what, is that, what does that mean? It was customary outside the Jewish community for pagan parents who did not want a son or a daughter. They would be inspected. And if they passed the father's inspection, they would be kept. But if the father, for whatever reason, and ladies, you didn't get a vote then, if the father didn't like the child or if he really did want a boy, that child would be taken and simply left in the wilderness. The Christians, rightly so, were horrified and broken at this. Because they look at the example of Jesus, they look at the New Testament, they look at the Old Testament and say, this is not God's design. So guess what the Christians did? They began to, to go find these children and, and bring them home and raise them as their own. What a beautiful picture of the mercy of Christ. And so if the Bible says, if the scriptures teach, if Jesus showed us that every single person, regardless of the age or the background or the stage has human value, then let's ask the question today, as many are asking, who qualifies? So let's look at number two, the specifics of human value and who qualifies. There are some who will say there is a difference between uh, some who are human and some who are persons, because persons have rights, but not all humans do. And right here, it's very helpful for us to remember what King Solomon said 3,000 years ago, that there is nothing new under the sun. That throughout our history, as humans, we have, on a number of occasions, put blood, sweat, and tears into trying to deprive one another of basic human rights far often than we've been willing to give those basic human rights. If you want to argue for some humans not being persons, you need to ask yourself the question, what exactly is it? And by the way, we've only lost one person so far, and we're almost halfway done. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. But ask yourself the question, if there's a tremendous pushback in your heart, what is it that's causing me to push back against what Scripture is clear on? We know throughout human history, there's everything from the Soviet Union to where Lenin labeled entire categories of people as, quote, former persons or parasites or class enemies. We know in this country, through chattel slavery, and it took a civil war, that an entire group was refused basic human rights. Since abortion has been legalized in this country, as of last year, over 60 million unborn children have been aborted. So let's ask a few questions. If you can hang with me for the next 14 minutes, I believe God's going to do something special in our hearts. Let's ask the question regarding human value with this acronym, SLED, S-L-E-D. Number one, size. Does someone's weight or height determine whether or not they are human? Some will say, well, um, Let's take the unborn child for a few moments. Um, it's so small, it, it can't possibly be uh, worthy of human rights. We ask the question, at what point does life begin? Every embryology textbook will tell us, from Christians or non-Christians, that life begins at conception. And some will say, well, it may be the level of development, SLED, uh, S-L-E-D, the level of development. This is a thought for our high school students. According to science, uh, you are less developed than your parents. But does that mean that your parents are more human than you are? Francis Crick argued, no newborn infant should be declared human until it has passed certain tests regarding its genetic endowment, and if it fails these tests, it forfeits the right to life. Again, Peter Singer, Princeton ethicist, says a three-year-old is a gray case. Killing them, therefore, cannot be equated with killing normal human beings or any other self-conscious beings. The conclusion is not limited to infants who, because of irreversible intellectual disabilities, will never be rational, self-conscious beings. As disturbing as that may be to some of us to hear, Singer is consistent that if we are not fully persons from the beginning, it ultimately comes down to those in power deciding when we actually become persons. And this is why we need Jesus Christ, guys. 
This is why we need the gospel in 2019. Jesus Christ and his teachings, his example, his truth, that is the best safeguard that we have for continuing to both value and protect little children and regard those of us that are born as equals in the sight of God. So the best question to ask uh, may not even be when does life begin, but what is it? Some will say, well, Pastor Jeff, uh, this is a popular pushback to uh, what Scripture has always said. And that's fine. We welcome conversations. Anybody notice it's tense in the room? Okay. And here's how it goes. Well, Pastor Jeff, an acorn is not a tree. Therefore, a fetus is not a human. Just as the acorn has potentiality to become a tree, the fetus has potentiality to become a tree. A human. To that we can say, as we're thinking this morning, Christians and non-Christians trying to think rationally together, that the acorn, please hear this, is by nature an oak tree. It is an undeveloped tree, and it develops as an oak tree, not into an oak tree. It is correct to say that the acorn is not a tree, but its nature is still oak. In other words, you and I don't develop into being humans. We develop as what we are, which is human. What you are and what I am, by our very essence, is what we are from the beginning all the way until the end of our life. Another question, environment. Does your location make you more or less of a human being? Some will say, well, a child that is born or two or three or five months or, or newly born, that, that is a person, but not the fetus. It's at this point that we want to put on our thinking cap and remember, back from school, that fetus is Latin for unborn child. So it would be helpful to not use words as smoke screens, but to understand exactly what we're talking about. And finally, there's the degree of dependency. The degree of dependency. Does dependence upon another person make you more or less of a human being? In other words, if you or I get into a car wreck and we have to be hooked up to a machine to live for a certain amount of time, does that mean that we are no longer persons? Some questions uh, about uh, abortion would be, what about, Pastor Jeff, what about cases of rape or incest? Well, first, as Christians, foremost, above all, we understand, we recognize the horror of, of violence and can say based upon the word of God that we condemn all forms of violence especially sexual violence and the righteous judgment of God awaits those who commit such acts who are unwilling to repent we've also provided and specifically in this church tremendous resources for our ladies who have been victimized by sexual violence and know that Jesus Christ is there for us Second, another thought would be to imagine a baby produced either through uh, the loving um, sexual relations of a husband and wife or a one-night stand with a stranger or through sexual violence. And our question is, does the value of the baby diminish based upon how the baby came to be? The question is ultimately not um, on how the child got there, but whether or not the child is human. Even, for those of you who've studied this in depth, Judith Jarvis Thompson, who famously defended abortion on demand in her famous article in defense of abortion in the early 1970s, and I have the original journal article. She writes, Surely the question of whether you have a right to life at all or how much of it you have shouldn't turn on the question of whether or not you are the product of rape. And third, who is the guilty party? The mother? No. The unborn child? No. It's the man who committed the act. So we don't want to punish the child for the crime of the father. We punish the one who's guilty. And fourth, the data suggests across the board that the number of U.S. abortions coming from both rape and incest is 1%. You can find this online for our state specifically. The state of Florida in 2018, there were 70,083 abortions in our state. Those that uh, came about through an incestuous relationship, it was 0.01%. And those that came through the result of sexual violence was 014 
So the data seems to, to suggest, specifically in the state of Florida, that the majority of times that a child is lost in abortion, it's because not of health reasons, but because of personal convenience. For example, this is on our state government's website, that 20% uh, of the, our abortions were for social or economic reasons, and then 75.4 was for no reason at all or elective. And here's where we, we need the grace of Jesus Christ to help our hearts become compassionate for those who cannot help themselves and compassionate for our, our ladies who have had an abortion and to let them know that there is hope in Jesus Christ and even for our men who have encouraged it and supported that. And in many cases, there's pressure placed on uh, our ladies from a man. So what about the life of the mother, to save the life of the mother? First, and again, we have to think clearly here, if the goal is to save the life of the mother, it's not direct abortion. Trying to save the life of the mother, trying to save the mother is the intention. But if the baby dies, as tragic as that is, it's not the same as an abortion, which is a medical procedure with one goal, which is the intentional termination of the human life. Second, since we are in 2019, the advance of medical technology has been tremendous. Uh, Eamon O'Dwyer, professor emeritus of gynecology at NYU Galway, sees direct abortion as almost always unnecessary to save the life of the mother. And she writes, as experienced practitioners and researchers in obstetrics and gynecology, we affirm that direct abortion is not medically necessary to save the life of the woman. And when we talk in terms of human rights for our ladies, to take a step back and consider what non-Christian scholars are observing all across the world, that since 1990, according to Steve Connor, uh, there has been a global shortfall of over 200 million little girls since 1990. It's now being referred to as gender side because worldwide, little girls are the vast, vast majority of abortions. So statistically speaking, one source reports the three deadliest words in the world currently are, it's a girl. And brothers and sisters, please hear your pastor's heart. This is tough to talk about. It's tough to hear. And for some of us in the room or watching online, and this is a, a part of our past, stay with us because Jesus Christ has good news for all of us. Because this is why we need Jesus. Jesus can cultivate a heart of compassion in us, and if we have regret from an action we've taken in the past, he can wash us clean and give us hope for going forward in our new life with Christ. That's why even today there are a number of uh, articles being advanced to say, well, if personhood does not begin in the womb, then it should be morally permissible to endorse and legalize what's called infanticide, which would be taking the life of your child that's already born up until the age of around two years old if you have regret after having brought him or her into the world. According to an article, an abstract in the British Journal of Medical Ethics, this article argues in the case of a number of medical professionals. Both, number one, fetuses and newborns do not have the same moral status as actual persons. Number two, the fact that both are potential persons is morally irrelevant. And number three, adoption is not always in the best interest of actual people. The authors argue, therefore, that what we call for after-birth abortion, and they say in their own words, which is killing a newborn, should be permissible in all the cases where abortion is, including cases where the newborn is not disabled. David Boonin, in his book, A Defense of Abortion, Cambridge Studies in Philosophy and Public Policy, published by Cambridge University Press, is more honest than most, and he writes in his foreword, and I quote, In the top drawer of my desk, I keep a picture of my son before he was born. The sonogram image is murky, but it reveals clear enough a small head tilted back slightly and an arm raised up and bent with the hand pointing back towards the face and the thumb extended out towards the mouth. There is no doubt in my mind that this picture, too, shows my son at a very early stage of his physical development, and there is no question that the position I defend in this book entails that it would have been morally permissible to end his life at this point. 
if we are not all people, then at a certain point, someone's going to try to chisel away at basic human rights. That's why Francis Schaeffer wrote many years ago in his book, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, and I quote, Cultures can be judged in many ways, but eventually every nation and every age must be judged by this test. How did it treat people? And again, brothers and sisters, we find in the early church a movement towards taking care of those who could not take care of themselves, to wait out at the places along the river where babies would be brought and left, to, to encourage those who were with child that God does have a plan for their child. And this adoption, this natural outflow of believing in Christ resulted in something that we today know as orphanages, which is a distinctly Christian movement. That's why Charles Spurgeon said in the 1800s, he's challenged the skeptical world. He says, you don't believe in Christ? He says, let the God that answers by orphanages, let him be God. And through your giving, there are children all across the world, especially in the 1040 window through our, our one child ministry. And those children, there's a home right along the border of Burma in Southeast Asia to where every single child in that home is an orphan and they are all HIV positive. It's in an area of the world to where they would have no other recourse, no other hope. They probably would not be alive, but there is a group of people in West Palm Beach, Florida, it says, you know what? Jesus Christ loves the little ones. And even though I may never meet them, I have something within me that rises up to say, I care for those that are defenseless. And so again, if you're not yet a follower of Christ and you're here listening, we're, we're so glad that you're here. If you believe that orphanages are a good thing, that children should be cared for, you need to become a follower of Jesus Christ because Jesus can explain why you feel that way. In the early church, there was a Roman uh, leader, Roman political leader, who brought before him a local deacon from a church, and he was, he was making fun of how poor the church was and how they had nothing. He says, I want you, I'm, ca- I'm summoning you to bring back all of the treasures of the church. So the deacon went out, he collected all the children, he collected all of the lame, all the sick, all of those who could no longer work because of their physical inability, and he brought all of the ones that the Roman, Greco-Roman world says you have no value. He brought all that group of so-called outcasts and misfits before the ruler and said, these are are the treasures of the church. Because Jesus Christ changes everything. Jesus Christ changes our hearts and our minds to see value is not just in money and power and how smart we are and what we can do, but the beauty and the power and the value comes from what we are. In the industrial age, great Christians such as George Mueller were moved by God to to build orphanages to help children who are being worked to death in the mines. And through his labor, Christian compassion compassion eventually made its way into public policy in what we today know as child labor laws. Back in Rome in the 3rd or 4th century, there was a Christian leader named Telemachus who one day was there at the gladiatorial games watching young men butcher each other just for the crowd's enjoyment. And there was something that rose up within him. You know what I mean? When you see evil and he couldn't take it anymore, he jumps down into the Colosseum and he runs from young man to young man, holding their sword, holding their arm that held a sword, saying as loud as he could, in the name of Christ, forbear. Then he'd run to another one and he would hold that young man and plead and say, in the name of Christ, forbear. He lost his life that day in the Colosseum, but it was his example that brought to the the moral stupor of those watching human life has value. And the gladiatorial games were ended. In this country, those who were moved to bring about an end to chattel slavery find their motivation and their information and the word of God, and the teachings of Jesus Christ. Guys, the answer to a loss of human life, the answer to racism, the answer to disenfranchising the unborn in 2019 is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is what we need. So that's why 
we can come to Jesus Christ and know that our shame, our sin, and our guilt can be overcome through Jesus' salvation, grace, and peace. If anything we've said at this point strikes you so deep in your soul, you say, Pastor Jeff, I don't even know what to do. Come to Jesus. He will not cast you out. Come to Jesus. Say, what can, what can we do beyond that? Well, here are some next steps. Know that if this is your past, then you have an opportunity to help other people. The enemy wants you to be dominated by guilt, shame, and regret. But in Jesus Christ, we have the freedom of knowing we have been washed clean and been forgiven. This church has a number of people who serve in first care, which is a, a ministry, a service to expecting mothers. We have some folks, uh, one young man here in the room who works for uh, an orphanage ministry called Place of Hope. This church cares, not just for when the child is in the room, in the womb, but beyond. Secondly, we have a brand new ministry that we're going to start in eight days on Monday evening, October 7th through December 12th. It's called Surrendering the Secret. It's an abortion recovery group specifically for ladies. And to protect your, uh, to preserve, we should say, your anonymity, uh, you would call this number and this would go to someone who is not on staff here at Grace Fellowship. So if this is something that is so deep and so personal for you, uh, you would be able to go to this group and not one of our pastors or ministry directors would know who you are unless you feel led to share that with us. And we would love to encourage you any way that we can. There's also bottles for first care here that we're giving away for, uh, that you can fill with money and donations. There's also, if you have an interest in adoption or foster parenting, fill that out on the Connect card. We have people in this church who do that. They can give you some guidelines on where to start. And today as it was in the day of Telemachus. I believe the cry of our heart because of the mercy of Christ is in the name of Christ. Forbear. In the name of Christ, treat each other as people who have value in the eyes of God. In the name of Christ, forbear. God has a plan for your unborn child. In the name of Christ, forbear. And then in the name of Christ, let's reach out. In the name of Christ, through humility and through love, let's reach out.